Welcome, everyone. Uh, you are listening to and watching Measuring Up, uh, the new video cast series sponsored by the Institute for Public Relations Measurement Commission, uh, where we talk about the future of public relations and strategic communications, uh, and of course, measurement and evaluation. Uh, today, I'm very honored to be joined by my guest, Alan Kelly, who has um, really been championing an important message for the strategic communications community. Um, and I'm looking forward to digging into it. Uh, he's also had a wide ranging career from founding and managing his, uh, his own strategic communications consultancy to being deeply involved in the research and academic world uh, in this ecosystem of communications. Uh, and of course, over the last several years, um, really uh, focused on the proliferation of this system for, uh, for the community uh, that can start to professionalize things a little bit more. Uh, so I'm very excited to dig in, Alan. Welcome to the show. Happy to be here. Hi, Mo. Hi, Alan. Uh, thanks again for making time for us today. Uh, why don't we just start out, Alan, by talking a little bit about your journey over the years and what's really led uh, you to, to develop this unique perspective you have on the future of public relations? Sure. Uh, you know, this system that we'll talk about is something that I debuted to the, uh, the IPR community a number of years ago back in Miami. So it's appropriate, I think, that we come full circle. Um, it's really been a very important touchstone for me. The, uh, the notion of strategy and communication has been on my mind since very early in my career, in the early 80s, I will date myself, and particularly influenced by a guy named Regis McKenna, who through the 80s in Silicon Valley, where I was located, was really the guru of tech and marketing and one of the top advisors to Steve Jobs. He sprouted a number of, of uh, prodigies, two of whom I worked for, Andy Cunningham and Joe Jennings. And Jennings in particular took Regis McKenna theory and his own political background, and he started talking about plays. And, and he was unabashedly um, competitive in his perspective to say, we go out, we try to seed a conversation, we try to win a debate, um, we try to advance the comp relative competitive advantage of our clients. And I found that utterly liberating. It made so much automatic sense to me. Um, you know, my background educationally is in PR. I went to USC, got a degree in PR. I was the national chairman of PRSSA in 1980. So I was really indoctrinated and I got, I did master's work in communication research. Uh, you know, so, you know, I was sort of being taught that, that PR is a form of, of information, of mutual um, symmetric uh, you know, fair and two-way communication. It was there to serve a mutual purpose, but it never quite made sense to me. So when I met Jennings, it just went pow. And when it really went pow was um, literally a day, September 4th, 1995, the 25th anniversary approaches, when uh, the CEO of my big client, Oracle Corporation, my firm's client, said in front of Bill Gates, at a technology conference, he said, the PC is a ridiculous device. <laughs> and he just spat it. Well, the, you know, the, the press went wild about that. It was Larry Ellison being a jerk again. And there's a long backstory to that. And you can read my book about it. But the real point is that I thought at that time, I thought, hmm, he's doing something. He's doing a thing. Now, what is that thing? And people say, well, he's poking a finger in his chest or he's spitting his eyes, whatever. And, and we all sort of knew, but we didn't know exactly. And that was it. Then I thought, oh my God, is it possible that, that we could name that thing, that we could define it, we could draw it, we could understand its characteristics. And if there's one, could there be two? And if there's three, oh my God, we could have a periodic table of PR, or maybe it's more than that. Because I thought, and that is sort of what is, was sort of generally frustrating me is why aren't we practicing communications as a competitive function? We know it really is. And why aren't we akin and as, and as honest and as clear and as transparent about it, what we do as a biologist is with a phylogenetic tree or as a graphic artist is with a Pantone system? We, we, had, we had then, you know, we didn't have those things. So that is hopefully a short story about you know my my journey in communications and strategy and how i how i come to see things as i do sure 
Alan, to follow up on that, one of the unique aspects of your career, there, there are many, I think, but, but one of them is the sort of dual presence you've had in the practitioner community, you know, uh, running and scaling your, you know, your own uh, strategic communications firm, but, but also the academic community. Um, so, so one of the questions that I have, Alan, is what you've learned about the similarities and differences between uh, these two communities in, in terms of how they view communications and public relations. Well, this, there's an overlap. I mean, a large part of the practicing communi community tends to overlap with, ed with education and academics. And, and that, that overlap and then the academic group, they tend all to believe the notions that, um, that, that this is about relationships that this is about reputation, that this is about trust. They certainly agree with my good friend, Jim Grunig, really kind of the godfather of comm theory in a way, you know, of that, that the work that they do should be two-way and symmetric, meaning in other words, fair and nice and balanced and considerate, like a conversation we're having is two-way and symmetric. Um, that is the dominant paradigm um, that really speaks to and supports this ethic in public relations that we're here to serve this mutual purpose. We're here to literally do public relations. Um, and so that is sort of what one large constituency says and talks about. Now, the practical side of it, the side that is really kind of outside their sphere, which is a very, very large um, constituency, um, has no tethering to that. You know, their their job is to go out and what I'll impolitely call newsjack, or commit what I'll impolitely call spin information. Um, and that is to figure out if you're representing Cheetos, if you're representing stovetop stuffing, you know, how to inveigle those two brands into something which is currently in the news stream. Um, when you think about it, You've got, you've got, it has to be thousands, tens of thousands of pitches going out to the free press and media in the fourth estate saying, hey, talk to me, listen to me, this is news, this is news, and it's not news. And in fact, it is absolutely fake news. It's false news. It's fabricated news. Um, and so that's not two-way symmetric. That has nothing to do with reputation management or trust or any of those things. And so really one is fighting against the other. There's this massive gulf, I think, between sort of what's going on in the, the Ivy Halls and what's going on in the back streets of, of PR. Indeed, and uh, that kind of tug and war, if you will, is, uh, is, a, is a key consideration when we think about this paradigm shift that uh, that you've been trying to facilitate about systemization in, uh, in communications and public relations. Um, Alan, I think that there are many, and I consider myself among uh, this group, that really see this shift as, as a necessary one and, and one that the ecosystem absolutely needs to make. Um, but one kind of additional dimension to this is uh, to look at it as uh, uh, in terms of change, you know, in terms of, you know, uh, maybe going from a place of subjectivity to a place of objectivity. That's, I think, a lot of how I personally perceive this paradigm shift that, uh, that you've been working on, on facilitating, uh, you know, this, the, along this, this whole time. Is that accurate, you know, in terms of, you know, what the system, you know, does for the ecosystem, moving it yeah. from subjectivity to objectivity? Yeah. Um, and, and tell us a little bit more about what needs to change, you know, in this, this domain of, of public relations and strategic communications. What does it mean to switch from, you know, subjectivity to objectivity in practical terms? I don't know if I have all the answers. Um, I will recount for you... Um, a sort of paraphrase conversations that I've had with Jim Grunick, who you'd think would be my enemy, but we've become fast friends. Um, and, you know, 
Jim, it, sort of in the world of theory, there's normative theory and then there's positive theory, things which are normative, which means really um, prescriptive, you know, things we should do, things that we should be, ways that we should behave and act and conduct ourselves. And then there's positive theory, which is kind of a weird word, but basically means observed and actual. And, uh, and not necessarily what we should do, but simply what we do do. So and this is the fun relationship I have with Jim is that he's got a normative, a very well established normative theory, which really suits how people and PR practitioners really want to think of themselves, you know, and, and then I've got, you know, a, a system, which I think at this point pretty responsibly and very meticulously uh, itemizes and organizes the specific uh, row and the seat number of the strategies that undergird uh, not just PR, but marketing, advertising, lobbying, litigation, any form of influence. And, um, you know, so I'm, when Jim and I talk, you know, we, we agree that we have different worldviews. And, um, but he will say, he will tell you that what I have is, is an elegant and precise system. He doesn't necessarily like it, um, but it's elegant and precise he says and i and i really appreciate that what the the industry the pr industry is really caught i think they're sort of put themselves into a corner because again what is actually happening versus what they say is happening is such a difference and they're not really willing i don't know if they're unwilling but it is not an easy jump um, to go and say, if you can see the, you know, the images behind me, it's not an easy jump to say, um, here is a publication, here, here are the chronicled strategies that actually are used in, in, the, in, the, in the efforts to influence. I don't even think the PR industry wants to talk about influence, much less manipulation, and sure as hell they want to distance themselves way away from things like P for propaganda. Um, you know, they want to talk about being information brokers. They want to talk about, uh, you know, principles like the page principles, like telling the truth. Um, I have a lot to say about that, but that's another day maybe. But, um, you know, they want to be able to characterize or beautify a function that is sure is all necessary, but I'm not sure it's necessarily beautiful. So it's a really, I think it is a really awkward and grinding transition but if we will go there, if we will ultimately acknowledge uh, whether you agree with my system or find someone else's, if we really will agree on what the actuals are the business, then I think we'll find new footing. I think we can be finally more honest with ourselves. I think the credibility, which is very, very low for PR, will go up because people start to understand what they really are. They'll say, oh, okay, you're in the influence business. Oh, okay, fine. You know. Um, I think that's where we have to go, but it's not an easy transition. There's so many, there's thousands and thousands of jobs out there and practices and policies that support, you know, um, you know, a function which is not really what it says it is. Hmm. Not yet. A foundational component of your message, Alan, is uh, the influence system uh, that you've referenced a, a few times already. Uh, and my understanding is that the influence system has uh, three distinct components. Uh, uh, there's a taxonomy. Um, there is an illustration of the cycles of influence. And then there's the uh, individual components uh, or factors uh, of influence. So uh, let's actually, um, I'll, I'll bring this up on the screen here and uh, if it's okay with you, let's just walk through how these uh, different components uh, work together. Sure. I feel like I'm at the optometrist, don't you? Exactly. Well, this is really the, the, the centerpiece of what is called the Playmaker Influence System. It's called the Taxonomy of Influence Strategies. Um, sometimes, or actually very often, I, I call them colloquially plays, which goes back to my friend Joe Jennings, the, 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 uh, the Regis McKenna disciple. At any rate, it's my view that um, if you are in the act of or in, the, in, in an environment of influence, 
three things are always happening around you. And I don't think if it's if it's not influence, I don't think it's it's not these three things. So I think that if you see the second, the, the, the left third says condition. Well, those are strategies which essentially, um, I'm gonna cheat the, the graphic here, which essentially probe and frame, which sort of nudge and explore a little bit and then, and then essentially shape um, a, a matter. They're very low engagement. You can see that at the bottom arrow going to the right talks about engagement. Um, and so it's a low, so to condition is, is essentially a subtle form of influence. It might be the beginning of a sales cycle. It might be, um, you know, the broaching of a subject in negotiation or in a potential argument. Um, it might be, um, you know, the, the, the setting of uh, a scene um, in a script or in a PR plan. Mm -hmm. The middle uh, third is called control where you, and these are strategies which divert, uh, make things go away, go to the side, uh, or which freeze, which may attempt to make things stop or slow up. So you can see that as we go from condition to control, it starts to get more and more activist. You begin to sort of shed uh, the, uh, you know, the transparency of your motive. If you're starting to run, to, uh, that's my, my my lexicon, you starting to run plays that divert and which freeze, eh, you're starting to control a matter. It's no longer two way and symmetric like over on the left with conditioning. Right. And the right third is where you confront. These are, these are strategies that press, sort of push their way into a market or that provoke, which are, you know, sometimes even not too nice. Um, and clearly they're very high engagement. Um, the call out, the peacock, to bait somebody. Um, these are definitely provocative. You can probably sense also as we go shift to the right from low engagement to high engagement, that depending on your preferences, your philosophy, your worldview, you may start to become uncomfortable. You're thinking, oh, wait a minute, that's not my style. I don't call people out. I wouldn't bait somebody. And so rather quickly, you start to realize this is an ethics issue. This this thing automatically starts to dredge up or starts to ask questions of the limitations and the boundaries that we do or we don't, might or might not cross mm -hmm. in, in matters of ethics or maybe morality. And I find that a reaction to this is often like, well, you know, put that down, son. <laughs> put down that gun um, because that's dangerous. Well, Yes, of course it is. Communications and influence are very powerful things. We, we know that now. In the times we're living in, that's become really obvious. It is really dangerous and high-powered stuff we deal with. So my point is that, as though I'm saying to a biologist who says, uh, you know, I like your phylogenetic tree, but, but take out the sharks and snakes. I don't like sharks and snakes. I'm saying you can't, I can't take out sharks and snakes. It's what I've observed. It's what I believe and I can demonstrably prove through case histories, this is what's happening. You might not be running those plays, but others are. And so we have to acknowledge again, what is positive in our model rather than normative. Mm -hmm. And that is one of the reasons that with, especially within the PR community, a table like this, you know, comes with some controversy because it really asks questions, tough questions about what the profession or the practice really is and really does. Right. And I think, Alan, one of, the, one of the observations that I make is that, at least amongst the corporate communications community, they, they really only, in an idealistic sort of sense, they see their role as only in the condition category and within condition, they see it only as the frame category. Um, and so if you, when you start talking about the, you know, components under control and confront, et cetera, there's almost like this rejection that, oh, no, we're not doing that. All we're really doing is the items listed under, you know, condition and frame. We're labeling things, we're informing the public, we're invoking, we're, we're filtering, et cetera. And I'd like to contrast that with, for example, the way in which uh, the communicators in the public policy and, and world of politics 
think about their role, so to speak. I found that there's a stark difference between how the corporate communications world thinks about uh, what it means to be in communications versus how you know your sort of typical uh, political strategist or or campaign manager or um, even public opinion polling uh, oriented research organization working in the political ecosystem, how they think about yeah. um, the different strategies. I mean, there's almost like a acknowledgement that, yeah, I mean, part of what we do is conditioned, but we also do control and we do confront depends upon the situation. There's this kind of acknowledgement that these are different plays in our playbook. It just depends upon what we're trying to do and what the circumstances are. So I too never really understood this kind of, um, uh, this kind of shyness or maybe embarrassment from the corporate communications community about the existence of these other strategies in addition to uh, the conditioning side of things. So that's just my observation. Um, let's also talk a little bit about the cycles, uh, Alan. So how do these different, um, you know, strategies work together? Um, and is there a certain order of operations, et cetera? Uh, yeah, uh, the cycles of influence is the second or one of the three, um, you know, systems of the playmaker influence system. And I thought it was important uh, to articulate um, essentially a process that, again, to use my lexicon, by which plays are evaluated or planned or stimulated and executed. Um, it, you know, a lot of there's a lot of models out there, and I want to give a shout out to my good friend Don Stacks, who is who has really helped comb over this and um, keep me in line. But I think what what is what another thing which kind of has to be expressed and recognized, especially in PR, is that it's actually an entirely iterative and circular process. It's not, we'll do A, then B, then C, and it is by no means linear. And it's really not very well planned because stuff happens. It has to be iterative, it has to be highly reactive, and frankly, to be effective, it has to be very improvisational. By the way, if you want, and if you want to be improvisational, then you better understand what place you're gonna run. Um, so these cycles, one, one is a subset of the other. Maybe you can see that, how the blue and the red fits into the green, the blue, gray and the blue. Um, but what I'm really trying to say is that in any environment, um, you being in the middle, maybe being a focal actor, always have to deal, you know, not just with a partner and a customer, but with a competitor and maybe an editor. Um, you have there are at least four different basic types of interest that are always running plays on you or that you're receiving plays. And so you are in this constant margarita mixer <laughs> of strategies going around and around and around. So that's primarily what this, these models are intended to show is that this is a re iterative, it's circular and it's multiplayer. Very interesting, Alan. And then and, and finally, how do, um, what's the theory around the adjustment of, or, or, or the factors that, uh, that, that add context to the taxonomy and the cycles as we start to think about how practitioners can turn this into a kind of an actionable playbook, how yeah. do these factors of influence play into that? Well, the, when I was, when I had this idea in mind that I, that there, there could be a derivable, observable periodic table, you know, of moves and counter moves of strategies, you know, I had to have a, I had to figure out what the, what that criteria would be. And there is a criteria that's published. You can go to my website at Playmaker Systems and, uh, and, and look at it and judge it for yourself. But kind of the unsung hero, the, the, the thing which allowed me to figure out what the 23 plays are, were actually this system. Um, and these are essentially variables that a practitioner can adjust and maybe variables which get adjusted on them. You know, you don't control good luck or bad luck, for instance, but you might control humor, you might control balance, you might control attribution. Either way, this is, um, you know, really essentially a tip sheet for the, the factors which can uh, adjust um, and create 
the context within which plays are being run. So this is sort of like another analogy I make is kind of like panning for gold. You know, you got this, this pan of sand and dirt and you swish it around, swish it around. And the more I swish, the more I saw these things fall out of the pan and go, okay, that one's out, that one's out, that one's out. And finally I'm left with the nuggets, which are the plays themselves. So that's a little bit about, this is probably the least used, but to me the, the most unsung uh, and important of the three systems. Very interesting, Alan. Thanks for giving us a, kind of an overview of uh, how the taxonomy, the cycles, and the factors can be operationalized together to think about you know, what's happening and what needs to be done from a, from a communications and, and PR standpoint. Um, it's shocking to me that more playbooks like this, if you will, more systems like this, if you will, don't exist in this profession. Uh, you know, I, for one, have uh, I, I've sort of felt like uh, I've been going against the grain, um, even as someone who's relatively new to the ecosystem. I mean, I've not been in the communications world for more than 10 years. Um, and so I'm, uh, it's, it's a nascent journey, the one I've had in this space. But when I compare it to my other experiences dealing with the finance function or dealing with, you know, R&D and, and product development, et cetera, uh, or even something like HR, it always just shocked me that um, there's a system of record, there's a playbook, there's a method of um, of determining what the right move or what the, what the right thing to do was in in any given uh, scenario. But um, you know, but I but I rarely came across an equivalent uh, in the public relations community. So you know, when we talk about when when this ecosystem loves to talk about ROI and measurement and, you know, judging the efficacy of, of different, different initiatives, a system like this can actually now contextualize that further, right? So, yeah. you know, um, when you're trying to condition, chances are you have to measure and evaluate condition-oriented plays, you know, differently than other kinds of plays, you know, et cetera. And so I just think there's so much room for advancement in public relations and communications. And um, I can't say enough how something like this uh, can really pr propel the, you know, the discipline forward. So thanks again for, for sharing. Alan, as we, as we wrap up and as we um, conclude this conversation, a uh, question I've been really uh, sort of interested to, to get your perspective on is, is the future. Obviously, there's a change that you're working on facilitating in the ecosystem around systemization and, and really building a playbook for, uh, for the discipline. Um, but maybe you could provide a broader perspective uh, about what you are most excited uh, about as it pertains to the future of measurement and evaluation in, uh, in PR. Yeah, a couple of things. Um, I, I think that um, given that it's, you know, September in 2020, we have to make a comment real quick about COVID and what the new world is bringing or has brought us. I think that for as, for as important as purpose is and trust is and, and reputation, these are important concepts. I don't necessarily think that PR people own them or should own them. But they're important. I think what's going to become preeminent in terms of the skill set for public relations practitioners um, is to be able to use communications and PR as a competitive tool to differentiate, to go out and literally approach competitors and rivals or oppositional legislation or issues, things which in your, are in your way. Um, essentially what I'm saying is I think PR is going to need to go on the offense. And the reason it's going to have to go on the offense is because companies are going to have to go on the offense. Heydays are over. We've got to make margin. We've got to make profits. We can try to be the nicest and most purpose-driven firms we could ever be, and that might or might not placate um, our employees or our various stakeholders, but if we don't make the numbers, if we don't get the market share, if we don't do what we are designed to do best, we're not going to give anybody a job. We're not going to be able to satisfy anyone's uh, peripheral, you know, wants and needs 
of a social nature. So I think, I think that the CEOs and the CMOs and the CECOs are going to start to get the idea that, oh, crap, I've got to start using this thing as, as a tool uh, for owning and, and winning discussions and owning and setting criteria. I might be able to try to get everybody to like me reputation. I might be able to get everybody to trust me. I'm not sure. Um, but by God, I've got to figure out how to go get this much market share from that big guy over there because otherwise he's breathing down my neck. I know um, from my own experience and my own past life in tech PR and running my agency and having used the early instances of this, this system that that is actually how communications can be used. You can use it as a competitive function. So I think we're going to have to go there, um, you know, COVID with, with, with the COVID environment upon us. The second thing um, with respect to measurement is that, uh, you know, I hope that systems like this will encourage the, the measurement community, the commission like the one you chair, um, to think seriously about measuring strategy. I think strategy is the elemental, is the fundamental, it is the spices in the cabinet of the kitchen that we all work in. Mm -hmm. um, we can talk about words, we can talk about tone, we can talk about sentiment, but, but ultimately things that we know we actually do and we can actually measure our strategies. I think there's 23 of them. I think that they are in three different categories as we discussed. Um, they may or may not, the market may or may not want to buy that stuff because it could again expose the fact that this is really an active practice of influence, if not manipulation. That's a really tough thing to get over. Along those lines, what I'm doing right now with my system, which makes me most excited, is to take um, you know, the conventions in artificial intelligence, cognitive AI in particular, and uh, machine learning, and to apply them to my system. We're at a point right now, we have a proof of concept, a platform called Spindex. That's a registered trademark that we intend to market over time as this comes into more of a beta uh, stage. But we have a proof of concept where about a third of the system, eight of the 23 plays are now reading in volume at scale content. And, and, and they're deriving from that the plays which are beneath the pros. And so this can be a speech by a president, this can be an earnings uh, call uh, by an executive, but we're able to essentially feed right now English language into our system and, and produce signatures, if you will, of the rhetoric of the influence strategies which exist. And then we correlate them um, to the outcomes. That's not been done before. It's super exciting. It's really complex. Uh, I don't know if I have any business being in the world of artificial intelligence. You can make your own joke now. Um, but that's what's really fun. Alan, as you know, the mission of the Institute of Public Relations is to illuminate the science beneath the art of public relations. And I see a lot of this work as the epitome of just that. Um, Unfortunately, some in this ecosystem see this purely as a criticism of uh, sort of the precedent in the public relations um, domain. Uh, but I think more and more people are starting to see it as a contribution, a major contribution and a, an accelerant to where we need to go uh, as a discipline. So I really appreciate you walking us through uh, the ideas and um, uh, we're, uh, we're hopeful that the Institute's uh, community uh, engages with this uh, with this content. It'll be hosted on the website uh, as well as on YouTube. And uh, if you have any uh, follow up questions or or requests as they as it pertains to this conversation, we'll also provide contact information uh, attached to the video. Uh, thanks again, Alan, for your time, and uh, we'll uh, we'll continue this conversation soon. Thank you, Mel. You're a fine diplomat and a bridge builder. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Alan. Uh, IPR community, we'll, uh, we'll be back to you in about a week and a half. Thanks again.